Um, so as we mentioned, this interview is going to be really sort of primarily focused on language. Yes. Okay. Um, and sort of your experience with it and your knowledge of sort of your family's experiences with it. So okay. first of all, um, Hanada actually gave us this sort of like the statement or quote. Um, and we thought maybe we'd ask you how you felt about it and sort of if you agree with it. Okay. Um, so it is known that language is a mirror of culture and the two are faces of the same coin. So how do you feel about that? <laughs> Okay, well, you know, the Arabic language is a very flowery language. And my father, who his first language was Arabic, even though he was born in the United States, he went back to Syria um, and went to school there when he was young and then came back. Um, he could not talk... If you were to draw a line, the way he would speak, it would be up and down and around and curly cue and, I mean, Pop could not talk in a straight line. He was very flowery. And I always thought about that. I thought, you know, that must be a reflection of his culture, his having uh, Arabic as his first language, speaking Arabic at home. Um, you know, uh, but my parents, they didn't, they didn't speak Arabic to us kids. And so, I mean, my culture doesn't, I think, come from language. Uh, it comes from other things like, well, food. Of course, I know all the words for food. I know a lot of swear words. Uh, my grandmother I remember I met these two Lebanese women in Paris when I lived there. And uh, I always wondered when my grandmother got mad, she would say, <laughs> and I never understood. I asked my grandmother once, she says, oh, may your house be destroyed in fire. Well, you know, bait is house. <laughs> it's not a nice word. So, but grandma, she was, she was a salty lady and uh, uh, she used, she, she used that, that expression when she got angry or, yeah, or frustrated. It was very funny. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Culture and language are the same. Uh, I don't know how to answer that. That's uh, it. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, food, food and the language, Arabic language, that's, that's my culture. Are there sort of any other specific words or phrases that you remember that maybe sort of trigger an emotional response if you were to hear them? Um, let me think. Um, Grandma would say, skitty, you know, get out of here. <laughs> uh, uh, my father used to use endearing words to us children. He'd say, karasa, you know, which is cherry. Uh, ya habibi. Uh, ya hayune. He always used those endearing words, especially to my mother. He was very affectionate. Uh, he, he was very... I don't know if this is the right word, Eff effusive. I, I have a little brain frog, but you know, he, he, he was over the top with his language in English. In Arabic, you know, I, he didn't speak Arabic. I said, I told you, he taught us the Our Father uh, because he thought in, by learning something and memorizing something, we would perhaps learn the language, but we had no one to talk to. Um, uh, we, our cousins, we get together and we would start using, you know, swear words like dib, like that's a really bad word. <laughs> dib is a, is a bear, if you call some, or a hamar, which is a jackass. Those are really insulting. <laughs> so that's, yeah. 
those are things. But you know, um, um, uh, I would go to Rana, you know, Rana Kaboob, Rana O'Day. Her husband, Fadel Kaboob, teaches economics. And her, her mother is from Jordan and her father is from Palestine. And we became very good friends. She's quite a bit younger. I mean, she could be my daughter. Um, anyway, I hear her speaking to her children. And, you know, these were, I understand some of those, those uh, expressions. Um, so, you know, somewhere back in my brain, there's a little bit of Arabic, but really not enough to converse. So I remember, oh wait, Eric, you can speak. Oh, uh, you mentioned uh, in the previous interview, I believe that your father was uh, fluent in French as well. So uh, to what extent did, uh, were languages other than Arabic and English used in your household? Okay, well, um, my father had a factory and my mother worked in the factory. It was their business. And his employees were mostly uh, from Puerto Rico, Cuba, Central America. And this is Spanish. Uh, mom and pop in the, in the factory, and I worked in the factory uh, on vacation and uh, uh, during the summers. And you know, my parents were conversing with the employees always in Spanish. Um, my father, of course, was an opera singer, and so he knew French. And uh, in 1981, uh, we were in Paris for a year. My husband um, was uh, running the Sweetbriar program. And uh, my parents came over. And so when we were there, and Pop was talking to everyone on the street and, you know, his French was wonderful, but we didn't speak French at home and we didn't speak uh, Spanish at home because they weren't for our first languages. Um, but, you know, my mother was from South America. Her first language was uh, Spanish, and Arabic, I mean, simultaneously, I would say. Like someone who comes from, um, from the Middle East, you know, they, they speak at home, they speak Arabic, but when they go to school or work, they speak English. So yeah, we didn't, but languages were always important. And my father, he would come home and he'd, he'd say something in French or he'd say something in Italian, you know, just playing around with words. He loved words. That's, that's the extent. And so you mentioned that, um, I think in the previous interview that you also speak French. Uh, I do, I do. I mean, I, uh, it depends. I mean, it, it's been a long time since I've lived in France. And so, um, you know, there are times when I can speak it very well. And then there's sometimes I'm, especially if I'm tired, I can't speak it. But, you know, as I said, um, I, I went to Ohio State for two quarters uh, to try to learn Arabic. But then I had to stop. Um, I couldn't continue. And when I was in college, I went to St. Nicholas Cathedral, the church that I mentioned to you, and there was Father Aboud, who was teaching in the basement of the church, who was teaching Arabic. And, you know, we tried, my twin sister and I tried to learn it, but he wasn't a very good teacher. <laughs> so. I'm wondering if, so, you have a sort of a opinion on the use of French in Syria and oh, whether this, and maybe if your parents had an, like an opinion on this and if you could share that with us. Well, my grandmother um, in Damascus, she went to French convent school and um, I wish I had her notebook. It's disappeared. It was really a beautiful notebook. I don't, I, it's ha things haven't changed in a century in French education because my son who went to French school, his notebook was exactly like my grandmother's notebook. 
<laughs> the way he, they had to write, and then the teacher would put bien, ou très bien, ou bon, or whatever. And you, in the notebooks, they would have different subjects. Anyway, um, my grandmother was very, very proud of that. When I was learning French in college, I wrote to her and, in, and she wrote to me back in French. And I had my great aunt Bertha, when she met my husband and learned that he was a French professor, she would speak to him in French, even though she was like 85 years old and hadn't been, um, you know, been in Syria or for a long time. But my grandmother hated the French. And I'll tell you why, because I think it was in, there was a massacre of the French. After World War I, you know, the French had a mandate. They controlled Syria and Lebanon. And um, uh, there was a, 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 an uprising. They wanted, the Syrians wanted their own government. They wanted control. And there was a massacre by the French of the people in, uh, I think it was Damascus. So grandma really did not like the French. But, um, you know, I, when I, this father Aboud at St. Nicholas Cathedral, where I tried to learn Arabic, I asked him, you know, what language do you think in? And he was from Lebanon, and he said French. And I had a cut, my father's cousin, who uh, came on an exchange from Egypt, um, he was fluent in French because the French, had a big sphere of influence in Egypt. And so, you know, he spoke French uh, and English as well. Did I answer the uh, question? Yes, no, definitely. Okay. I'm wondering if you personally have an opinion on the use of French um, in Syria, even today, and like, how well, does it feel? Um, well, I mean, things have changed so much in Syria. Um, the influence of the West, you know, has diminished. Um, but the elite, you know, there's certain snobbery. And so, yeah, using French, you know, kind of maybe lifts you up a level. But, you know, I, I, I'm really not an expert on that. But yeah, people do still speak French, um, or at least the people that I met uh, from Syria and from Egypt and from Lebanon. Yeah, they spoke French. Okay. And then, so if we sort of like change the tune back to Arabic, I know, so you obviously don't speak it and like it wasn't really spoken to you as a child. Mm -hmm. Do you think this shaped your identity as an Arab? So did you, do you feel a difference between yourself, sort of a non-Arabic speaking, compared to somebody who is? No, Maybe. absolutely, I identify with being an Arab. I, I, I really do, because, you know, the culture of, of uh, the Arabs it has been ignored in, West, in the West and in Western education. Um, and so, you know, whenever I can speak about the culture, um, I do, because I'm proud of being Syrian. And um, I have another, my, my mother uh, had these two uncles. She was, her uncles, because my grandmother got married so young, she was 16. Um, and, and I think she was 18, 19 when she had mom. She had younger brothers. And uh, she had this one uncle, William, who was, quite a bit younger than, than my grandmother. And he and um, E.J. Audi, uh, they lived in um, Greenwich Village. They had an apartment together uh, and they were a good friend of Cahil Gibran. And they would invite my mother to, they would, every Sunday they would have a brunch and mom would go uh, to this brunch, and of course she met Cahill Gibran. And, you know, to me, uh, he's, he's just an incredible, incredible poet. Uh, he's so wise, and, um, and I've, I've given my children uh, his 
his books of poetry because I want them to know that culture, that art, that poet. And so, um, yeah, at my, my, one of my boys' um, weddings, uh, his brother quoted uh, Cahil Gibran on marriage. You know, it's like two trees that stand together and one shouldn't overshadow the other. You know, I'm just paraphrasing it, but it was so eloquently said. So there's been sort of recently and maybe forever a lot of talk specifically regarding sort of Hispanic immigrants and their use of Spanish and maybe sort of prejudices towards them because of that use sort of people saying on the street, you know, don't speak English. Is that something you notice um, sort of in your upbringing regarding Arabic? Um, I never saw that. Uh, I never saw that. Uh, people, um, you know, being mean to my parents when they would speak Arabic. I didn't. Um, you know, we lived in Brooklyn, New York, and it was a very multicultural uh, community. Um, and you know how the Arabs um, interacted with their Irish or Italian neighbors? It was through food. And, um, you know, whenever I would meet someone, and people, oh, I don't know if this happens to you, but a lot of people would ask me what my heritage is. And, you know, as I said before, you know, I would say Lebanese because uh, Syrians were the bad guys. But now I say Syria because they're not the bad guys. Just Assad is the bad guy. Um, uh, but they would say, oh, my neighbor, so-and-so, oh, she made us the most wonderful food. And, you know, they always talk about kusa mechshi or kibbe or, you know, whatever. And, and the Syrians are very generous, very hospitable, and especially with food. And my, my husband, who comes from an Irish Catholic background, you know, was kind of blown away when he would come to my parents' house, you know, the amount of food, and it would be foisted on you, and you couldn't say no, <laughs> um, because that's an extension of generosity. Um, and, and, and if you talk to people, there, there is this, this uh, generosity of spirit, this um, welcoming on the part of Arabs, Syrians, and Lebanese. Did you see that growing up like the same in the other communities? So the sort of Irish or the Latinos, or um, you mentioned Scandinavians, um, sort of food being more of a bridge? Um, well, uh, uh, you know, in the street, the street where I lived, there were uh, yeah, Irish. Oh, Mrs. Sorensen, I forgot all about her. Yeah, my mom, you know, if she would have them over. Uh, yeah, they love the food because let me tell you, Irish food and uh, Scandinavian food is, uh, I'm not, hope I'm not insulting you. You know, it's, it's can be good and but it's very simple. <laughs> it's, yeah. So they love the food. Absolutely. You mentioned that uh, a lot of the uh, Arabic children would sort of stick together. Like a lot of your friends were also, and as a child, were also Arabic. And mm, no, no, no. Um, growing up, my friends were, I I'm one of five children, uh, were my brothers and sisters and my cousins. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it was just the way it was. I never, oh, of course there was Marion Franco and um, Pat Kearns who lived on our street. We were friends, but um, doing things together, it was mostly within the family. You know, the get togethers were always with the family. Um, and I had a lot of cousins my age. 
So, yeah, I mean, uh, we were friend, they were, you know, as friendly in school, there was no problem. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry, Eric, do you have anything you want to follow up on? Okay, um, so I was wondering if, so I know sort of this is a way of preserving like sort of your family history within like this like oral history and clearly I mean you've sent us like a lot of um, sort of documents and photos and messages that have been written down and thank you for those we really appreciate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is there I mean are there any other ways that your family has sort of participated or show like sort of like shown pride in preserving their heritage? I know you mentioned the museums, but can you yeah. explain that? Yeah, well, a few years ago, one of my cousins, my, mo my mother's cousin, who's more my age, um, he had a huge family reunion and he wrote this document. I've sent, I sent you a few pages of it, uh, but he created this big family tree. Um, and, but you know, uh, our relatives didn't talk that much about their lives. Uh, so there's a lot of oral history or written history that's missing. But, uh, and then that was about eight years ago. And about four years ago, um, there was another family reunion in sh actually here in Chicago. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, the ones who are the most proud of their Syrian heritage are my um, cousins who are uh, half, half, you know, half Syrian and half Irish or half whatever. I mean, they're looking for that connection. And, um, you know, they would write to me and ask me or my sisters for um, recipes because, you know, it's a very interesting culture. Um, do you think, I mean, do you see sort of a reason why um, sort of the older generations sort of spoke less about their culture? Do you think there was a reason or just sort of the times? Well, uh, they wanted to become Americanized. That was the thing. You know, they've left their country and they made a good life. You know, uh, I can't think of one of my s parents, Syrian friends or relatives who didn't own their own home. Um, they were all, most of them owned their own businesses. Um, yeah, uh, they were very entrepreneurial. And uh, most of them believed in education, primarily for the boys. <laughs> My generation for the girls was expectation you're gonna get married, so, you know. Uh, there wasn't that push to go to higher education or whereas I think that the I think that the um, uh, can t the the immigrants from uh, Syria and Palestine and Jordan and I think that there is this um, notion that women that their daughters should also be educated um, and it was only because of my father that we went to college. And so, so, I mean, you mentioned they sort of a desire to be Americanized and mm -hmm. clearly they were sort of successful in that, but obviously maintain their culture. Do you see like a difference now in sort of the immigrant journeys that are in the media and sort of the stigmas attached to like sort of attempting to Americanize. Um, do you have an opinion on this? Not really. Uh, you know, I think that, that the um, creation of the state of Israel has um, changed a lot of what was, you know, what's going on in the Middle East and what, what, um, what the people who are coming from those regions in the Middle East, uh, you know, how they think and how they behave. But you know what, Syria is interesting. Um, I, I've met some refugees from the Golan Heights 
this is many years ago, um, they send their kids to, to all to college. It was so funny. I have this daughter, she's 42 years old, blonde. <laughs> and we went to, they have these, oh, what are they called? Uh, they, they, there would be these get togethers. Oh, that's something I didn't talk about because we never went to one. Um, but a lot of the Syrians and Lebanese, they would get together. I can't remember the word. It's a hefle or um, it, it was a big party. Uh, it was in Cleveland and there would be Arabic music and Arabic food. And um, uh, in fact, a friend of mine whose husband taught at Denison, her father uh, was a mu musician. He, he, play, he played uh, Arabic music and he would play in these, I think the word is a hefla, I'm not sure. But um, so I met this woman from the Golan Heights and she had a son in medical school and she wanted to connect my daughter with this guy. And he was really quite good looking and, but Emily wasn't interested. She was 18 years old. But, you know, I guess they, they think in the old world, you know, they're going to arrange something. Um, but anyhow, he was, he became a doctor up, I think in Toledo. But yeah, I forgot about those big get togethers. And so that's where a lot of the people would, you know, reinforce their culture. But my family and, and we didn't, we didn't do the, those sorts of things. My mother, when she was young, she would, but you know, uh, when she had a family that we didn't, we didn't get involved like that. Um, did your, like your children attend these sorts of events or no? No, no. Well, I know this, like so we sort of um, have touched on language already in this interview, obviously that was mm -hmm. the and then last week um more sort of like general family history mm -hmm. next week sort of food and holidays is okay. there anything sort of so far that you think um, we may have overseen that you would see as sort of a oppressing issue you'd like to discuss no uh, i'll think about it uh, uh and i'll i'll email you okay please uh, yeah yeah i i've i've sent you a lot of stuff because, you know, I'll be thinking about something and, oh, I should have said this. But uh, I don't know if my family is a typical Syrian family. I don't know how many uh, Syrian families would have, uh, you know, known Cahil Gibran or gone, to, you know, uh, to meet him. And, but, um, I don't know how many Syrian families have a brother who worked on the Oslo Accord. Uh, you saw that. Uh, I sent you that email. Um, I, there, there's not one Syrian family that I know of where the father was a trained opera singer. Um, so I don't know how typical we are. I don't know. We're typical in that uh, we owned, my parents own their own business, um, which is what most of these people, uh, Syrians did. Um, yeah, and, and they believed in education, uh, but in my generation, it was mostly for the boys. And that's okay. We're not looking to sort of Mm -hmm. understand a typical experience sure. like your experience and your family's experience sure. Sure. i i really appreciate everything you've been mm -hmm. saying okay um, and we're gonna sort of start to like document it and structure it into a, and like sort of add it into the interview process so okay. thank you so much for that oh, you're welcome um, uh, you know it's been it's been a journey for me to go through all this and I want my children to to know where they came from, too. And uh, um, you know, I I um, let's see. I have this cousin who sent me the uh, 
family tree of the Holmesies. Um, he's he, because I couldn't find mine. And uh, could you open it? There was he, yes, could you get hold of the yes, Holmesies? I could, I could read it easily. Oh, okay, good. Because I couldn't, and I couldn't read. I couldn't print out uh, the narrative of George Holmesy, my father's cousin in Fresno, who talked about his life. Um, and and why he he went to California, so it was interesting. I didn't know that that my father's um, uncle didn't speak English very well, and that's why he didn't want to um, work in the business. <laughs> and so he went out to California. And Is that something that was common? Um, sort of those who didn't speak English as well had yeah. jobs and they like the public facing jobs. Sure. Had, I'm sorry, they had what? Um, less public facing jobs. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, it was, it was interesting. Um, it was an interesting journey for me too. <laughs>